Okay, so I think this could be pretty casual. I just started recording it. I'm going to edit this anyway. So if we say okay. anything, we can, it doesn't matter. I can just chop it out. Fine. But fine. what I wanted to do is, um, as you saw on my website, I'm starting to do members only content. Right. And um, I thought it would be neat to have conversations with uh, people that have a lot more experience than me in the dark room, which is okay. you for sure. <laughs> uh, and uh, I've only been in the dark room for, uh, let's see, late 2019. Okay. So not very long yet. And I keep saying, mm -hmm. I think it's going to take me 20 years to become competent. Um, yeah, I think one of the problems is keeping up to date with all the changes in products and even from batch to batch, you know, and it, not so much necessarily with silver paper now. But in the past, batches would change quite frequently. And so knowing how they react and knowing how to overcome those problems was always part of, you know, the, the, the darkroom process. Um, nowadays, of course, everything's changing all the time. So it's mm. just a moving target, whatever process you work with. Um, mm. But I think just being in the darkroom and just doing it on a regular basis, you get a feel for the materials a little more, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're multidisciplinary, right? As far as the mediums that you're working with, what, yeah, what are I, you, what are you working with the most often? Um, right now, silver of all things, I'm going back to silver. And in the past it was predominantly, so I started with silver in London and then I just, I would go to galleries just to give you a little bit of a history of you know, where I'm yeah. at. So I started printing in the late seventies, early eighties professionally. And all of, all of that would be silver, but I'd go to galleries and I'd see the Steikens and the Stieglitzes and the Paul Strands and the Graviers, you know, camera work. And I just thought mm -hmm. that's what I want to do. So fast forward a few years, I got into platinum in London and then I came out here to Minneapolis and I was at a symposium in Santa Fe uh, that uh, was hosted by Bostick and Sullivan and I happened to be um, sitting next to um, um, Dan Weldon who's going to give a demonstration the next day on polymer gravure and that was in 1999 and so I well, came back ordered a press and everyone who was working with that process at the time and remember this is really prior to digital it was all analog film positives all analog negs that we were working with and all the books i found were either from you know the scandinavian countries denmark and i couldn't read any of them so it was a real learning experience and then digital came along and of course you know made it a lot easier um so now i'm kind of you know, I, I guess silver, platinum, and polymer gravure are the three that I concentrate on. And I guess they are, I would say there's a a preference right now for silver or for platinum for the people that I work for. Um, so, you know, you never know how it's going to go, but it's nice because you're not, you're not working with one process day in, day out for, you know, months on end. It's always different. So, yeah, like can that. you can you explain that process a little? Polymer gravure. Yeah. So in the past, a, a traditional photogravure, copper plate gravure, you would have been working with acids, a sheet of copper, um, a, a tissue, a light sensitive tissue. All in all, it's pretty toxic. Um, mm -hmm. And so polymer gravure, you you buy the plates. They're steel backed. They have a light sensitive polymer coating to them and they process in water. Now, that's not to say it's completely non toxic. Right. I mean, there are, you know, you're dealing with polymers, but it means that you can go from printing a plate to uh, proofing within the hour. And for me, that's just phenomenal. <laughs> Instant. You know, I've, it's almost, it is. Yeah. It, it really is. And I've never worked with copper plate. But to me, this gives me, and it, people will come, they'll compare the two, copper plate versus polymer, and complain that you don't get as much shadow detail, you don't get this, you don't get that. But for me, it's not about 
I mean, my work is predominantly dark anyway. Mm -hmm. So losing that shadow detail isn't so much of a problem, but it's the fact that I can produce something that is handmade with inks. You've got the tactile quality coming through of the inks, the paper. And for all of my work, that tactile quality is what it's all about. Um, you know, I just love anything that, you know, is handmade like that is just beautiful. Yeah. And well, I, I see tell. that, in, and I see that in the classes I teach at the Minneapolis College of Art and Design. I teach a continuing ed class there on a regular basis, and people come in, and they can range from, you know, grad students all the way up to retirees. And half the class is usually photographers who want to get into printmaking, and the other half is usually printmakers who want to incorporate photography. And everyone's always astounded at how fast we can work and do do this process you know produce a print that's completely handmade and hand wiped and just smells wonderful yeah. <laughs> uh what what attracted to you back then because if you were a professional was it were you attracted to that process back then for your own work and oh, obviously yeah. for the process but it was not uh, for professional work no no none of the processes no one was asking into. for that no not at all and even you know, back in the early to mid eighties, early nineties, the photographers and the clients that I was work that I were working, I was working for, um, you know, they were so used to just asking for an eight by ten or a sixteen by twenty black and white print, and they had no idea about the toning um, that you could do, the you know, split toning, selenium toning. I mean, there was a lot of um, a lot of photographers that really had no idea as to what you could really do with a silver print. So photogravure and platinum were just, you know, way off the chart. No one had an idea. Um, and, you know, I, I like I say, I'd go to the galleries and I'd, it would be as if I was reverse engineering something. I'd look at the prints. I'd try to find out what the paper was, read up about it, go through old books of formula, formulae, you know, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there was a lot of a lot of work involved, and but I'm I'm like a little terrier, you know. Once I get my, you know, mindset on something, I've just got to figure it out. So, but those three processes are the ones that I love. Yeah, and, I see a little bit of that in myself. I maybe I'm not as uh, mm, persistent as I should be. I can get, I can get frustrated. I can get impatient. Um. But with darkroom printing and even film photography in general, I I think that's a good um, a good way for me to work on that for myself. Uh, yeah. Growing up in the digital age, uh, I certainly, you know, I'm 44 this year. So when I was younger, all there was was film cameras, of course. But as an adult, it's mostly been digital. Yeah. And for me to be purposely taking my time shooting less and being in the dark room, just being frustrated or <laughs> ruining film or whatever it is oh. uh, because of mistakes. And usually whenever I rush, that's when the mistakes happen. Um, I think it's a good thing for me to work on that part of myself as far as slowing myself down yeah. because with technology, um, I think it has created impatient people. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, th I think that impatience has always been there though because even back in London most of the clients that I worked for were just impatient they mm -hmm. didn't want to spend hours in the dark room you know trying to well, craft clients print. never want to do anything I mean <laughs> that's true whether that's, you're that's working very true. digital or not I mean but, clients are going to be clients on but, anything you know? you know one of the things I've noticed is that you know in, in London especially where space is at a premium most photographers you know, had never had a dark room, had yeah. never printed. They may have done that at college or when they were young, but because of the space, very few had dark rooms. Whereas over in the United States, it's very different. You know, spaces, there's more space. Most people have dark rooms. And so the people that I work for here tend to have that knowledge of dark room experience, which wasn't always the case in London. 
and that so can what be a year, good... what year was that where you came here and said and thought I came, everyone I came... everyone has a dark room <laughs> <laughs> i i came out in 96 1996 so okay yeah and you yeah. and the, your perspective at the time was wow there uh, everybody has well, a dark room my my perspective was from those people that i was working right with and for and most mm -hmm. of them had i mean and that's not to say that everyone you know had a dark room but you know the people that i was working with and um yeah and it can be a double-edged sword you know on the one hand they know exactly what they're talking about and so they've got a very definitive idea of what they want to end up with mm -hmm. whereas the you know some of the clients in london um were open to ideas they had no idea what could be achieved so you know yeah. it's um that's both ways so during the dark ages when digital was really coming up <laughs> um did you stick to these processes the entire time it was there ever a lull in between the 90s or, or, you, or the 70s and 80s when you really started and all the way till now was was there a, a lull in your practice no not at all i've you know i i've been interested in photography since i was a young kid my dad was a very avid photographer he knew a lot of um, professional photographers, press photographers. And so photography had always, I'd always been surrounded by it. Um, so no, I mean, it's, it's like having a dark room, you know, it's like we moved studios three years ago. And the first thing was I needed a dark room. It just mm -hmm. feels wrong not having one, but you know, I've been in the dark room all this week, last week. So it's, um, no, I, it, it even I've always been in, involved with, you know, silver, platinum, or reviewer. And there was a time for many years when I was working with three color gum dichromate for one photographer in the Twin Cities, Cydacos. Um And that was that was a process. I mean, you know, I don't I don't ever see that figuring in my personal work at all. Mm -hmm. If I'm going to make color prints for myself they will be inkjet so hmm. you know like a little i'm a i used to be a bit i used to be more of a control freak i'm kind of letting go now um <laughs> but yeah i mean i've i've always worked in black and white primarily because i could never see myself handing work off to someone else in color right. to have printed you know i like those desaturated colors i don't like anything that's really highly saturated and you know suddenly photoshop comes along and i can do that you know, I can yeah. make inkjet prints and with the papers that are available now, it, they look like a print that's been made in the dark room. I love that. So I do know one photographer that's doing some interesting stuff with color. I mean, there's many, but um, uh, Strickland on Instagram. Have you ever seen carbon? He's doing carbon. Oh, carbon colors. I think um, I, I don't know that process well enough to speak about it, but right. it looks it looks amazing. I mean, he's yeah. what a workshop he has too. Yeah, um, I know. I I, I know. He, I know who you're talking about. Michael, is it yeah. Michael Strickland? I, yeah, I know. And um, carbon is one of those processes that has never interested me because it is so. It seems so complicated. Yeah, I I, I watch some of his. Uh, videos and things and, mm -hmm. and i appreciate it but it does not draw me to it like right. other processes have you know right um well if we could talk about your work a little bit um sure i mean you have you have two websites right maybe you could explain why you have two websites <laughs> so well so originally i did combine the two and you know you'd go to the home page and there'd be personal work and then there would be the studio work i love your websites uh, by the way i love thank them. you thank yeah, you they're great um i was advised by several people to split the two because when you're applying for grants it's not always good to see that you're a commercial printer mm -hmm. and so i split the two got the domain names you know um and it's worked well it, you know i can update one without fear of you know upsetting something on the other i have you know both kind of very redundant uh, web logs um i don't post as often as i should um 
but it's nice to be able to keep the studio one for work that I'm working with clients and the other one just personal work but yeah it it, it does make life easier ironically having two websites and separating the two yeah, yeah. easier for you or do it you think is easier for whomever is looking for I, each each part of you <laughs> cer certainly easier yeah certainly easier for me but then you know if someone is looking for me you know as a client they don't have to scroll through all this endless stuff that is my personal work which may not interest them so you know it's uh it's worked well and you know they're both wordpress i tried working with kirby and i loved it it was fast but um you know i found it so difficult hosting and keeping things up to date and especially as my websites are predominantly image-based i found that to be a real hassle so do you do everything yourself yeah yeah and that came that came about back in 2000 when we registered our domain names um you know to hire a web developer was expensive i didn't have the money so it was like learn html and that's how i started yeah. um Dreamweaver, you know, and then I kind of dived around under the hood a little bit more and kind of found, I guess, you know, I, I kind of, I know about code. I wouldn't, you know, WordPress says code is poetry. I wouldn't necessarily say mine is, but it, <laughs> it works, you know, and uh, I'm happy with it. So. Oh, that's yeah. good. Uh, so if you could talk a little bit about your professional work and your personal projects, so, and um maybe maybe your professional work through the years if you want but but specifically what you're kind of up to now and what's on your web like what yeah. people would see on your website yeah so um I, you know i'll admit i've been in a bit of a slump lately mm -hmm. maybe pandemic related i don't know um i'm getting you know as big a kick out of working for other people as i do my own work right now uh, I, I'm not one to necessarily work with projects and I don't know why that is. I, I always carry a camera wherever I go. I'm always taking photographs. Um, and over the course of, you know, a year or two, they might form some semblance of a project, but yeah. I don't necessarily go out. I, I mean, I do have projects in mind. But it's trying to find the time like everyone, you know, to yeah. to because they're not locally. Well, you certainly um, publish your work in a project oriented format, I would say. Yeah, and but most of those have come about over the course of a few years, you know, just kind of come together. So the Badlands uh work, that was, you know, we'd always go out to the Badlands. When the kids were growing up, we loved the Badlands. It was just for a kid from London, I mean. It was just the wildest place, you sure. know. I've never seen anything like it. I've been and in so the that, Badlands, and I can attest to that. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 wonderful. Still love it. Um, you know, the Dark Matter project um, that was shot locally in Minnesota, and I had a state art school grant for that. And we're very fortunate in Minnesota that we have a lot of arts funding, and so I've uh, been fortunate to have five state art school grants. And those are you 10, mean uh, Alex Soth doesn't soak up all of those grants? No, no, no. Alex, <laughs> Alex, Alex, a friend, and he's, he's no, he doesn't. Okay, he's, you know, he's um, you, you know, he's got he, a lot of books. I figure someone's got to pay for those books. Absolutely, you know? and you know, that's <laughs> another thing. Talking of books, I mean, I had the uh, Minnesota Center for Book Arts uh, Fellowship back in 2011, and that was um, the Dark Matter Project. And until that point, it had never occurred to me that my work would be in a book form. Mm. And it's a portfolio. And when I um, I was talking to the executive director of, of the uh, center at one point, and I had planned originally on binding it. And he said that you're fighting the binding, just produce a portfolio case with a series of images, prints, and it has a start, it has an end, it tells a story that is a book and so that's what got me into the book arts but i still um you know i've produced books but i still don't think of myself 
working with the books or being a book artist, if that makes sense. Um, and, you know, at some point, like uh, I did, I did a small book of Instagram photographs at one point. Mm -hmm. And that just came about through Instagram. I thought, you know, I've got to do more than just put them up on someone else's, you know, website. Yeah. And so I printed them, bound them, did an edition of 25 and sold them immediately. So, yeah. um, but yeah, the book arts is, it, it, you know, it plays a big part in my life, but I still don't see myself as a book artist. But Well, it's interesting because you're using that term, a book artist, but I mean, you, you're, um, I don't know what term you use on your website because I don't have it open right now, but you do yeah. book binding correct i do book binding right i do binding and i do have a lot of case making portfolio cases which i love yeah. um and so when you say you're not a book artist you're kind of saying that as a photographer the end result of your work is not in your mind not a book right or correct. or not always a book it has been not a couple always times right 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 um I, see because i i think every project could be reformatted to be produced into any delivery method. I view mm -hmm. a book as a delivery method. Right. Right. You could collect work together to create a YouTube video. You could collect work sure. together to put together a portfolio, a set of images on your website. You could collect them to put them on Instagram and you could collect them to be put in a book or shown on a movie theater screen or whatever. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. All of those would take a lot of work and a lot of thought yeah. uh, between each of those delivery methods. But um, so I think a book is a delivery method for, it doesn't have to be imagery. It could be words, it yeah. could be whatever, but it's yeah. just one way of, of communicating uh, a body of work. Yeah, I, I agree. And, you know, I, I have one project in mind that will probably end up as a book. And it started off as a book to begin with, which is very rare for me. I don't think like I, with most of my work, when I make an image, I'm not thinking of whether it should be in gravure or platinum or silver or a book. Um, but I find I find it all working within you know books and editing and sequencing. I find that does not come easy to me. It's I find that very difficult. My wife is excellent. At sequencing but that's that's not an easy thing for me at all that's interesting yeah, yeah. And, i don't, you know, I don't know if i have that if i ever had that challenge yet. i've never put it together a book per se i put together what what could easily be printed as a book i put together like pdfs and shared them with friends right. and things and sure um i usually have a narrative of some sort to the images that i take personally Mm -hmm. uh, but they start that way in my head before they're even taken. Right. So something I haven't done, which is what you're talking about, is look through my entire catalog and find a project within it. Mm -hmm. I have not done that. I've always just thought of a project, went out and executed against my own ideas mm -hmm. uh, rather than um, you know, going through the thousands of images that I have and see like, oh, is there something here, you know, yeah. that is, that, that could be yeah. pulled out of here. Yeah. And, you know, I'm hopefully in a show this summer, um, just a local show, but, you know, I'm trying to think of what I can do. I wanted to start making work specifically for this show, doing something very different, something outside. How many of pieces what do you think you'll be able to have? I, it's flexible. I can have as many or as few as I as I wish. The um, criteria is that all the work, and there are three of us, four of us in the show, has to be small, which is great because my work's pretty small anyway. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm thinking maybe silver, um, maybe just going through and finding those images that I've made in the last few years that I've never got around to to doing anything with and um, seeing what comes of it that will they already be printed or you have to print them no i'll have to print them you see you know um 
in the past it would have been you know that shoebox under the bed full of prints that you tuck away and now look <laughs> you know now it's just on a hard drive so yeah I, you know if i shoot digitally they're on a hard drive if i shoot film they're in a box you know the negs are tucked away um so yeah i, I mean i'm pretty bad at getting around to printing my own work so i like to live with things for for a bit well <laughs> There's so many directions we could take this conversation. Yeah, I I really firmly believe that I'm shooting for 10 years from now. Everything that I'm currently working on, um, even family portraits, like I'll take a picture of sure. my niece and her new husband with my parents, mm -hmm. and I am not shooting that for today. Right. You know? Um, yeah. And... So it's interesting. I think the longer it waits around, the more it means to me personally. And and I'm doing this for me anyway. I'm not a professional. So everything that I do is for me. And then yeah. if somebody else happens to enjoy it or whatever, I think that's that's great. But um, no, a gallery a gallery owner once said to me, There will never be an exhibition entitled New Work from me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, spot on. No, there won't be. No. Did you watch um do you watch YouTube for, do you watch uh, Nick Carver at all? No, I don't. Okay. Well, he, he recently just put together a, uh, a show in California and he's a large, uh, not large format. He, he shoots six by 17, which I guess some would okay. could say yep. is large format. Yep. Um, and he would probably, he's probably going to Instagram DM me like, what do you mean? It's not large format uh now that i finally i got my first four by five camera and now i can mm -hmm. say okay now i'm shooting a large format yep, absolutely <laughs> <laughs> i am bragging i am bragging right now but um so he shoots six by 17 uh, amazing images and he prints very large he mainly scans and prints like mm -hmm. what you're talking about and um when he was putting together his show he shared a lot of the numbers with people yep. like here's you know, some of the costs associated with printing as large as he does mm -hmm. and the number of prints he had. I don't remember exactly how many he had, but it was probably almost two dozen prints in, in this show or something like that. And so, you know, you're talking thousands of dollars Absolutely. worth of printing and framing and everything. Um, at this stage in your life, doing an exhibition like this locally, um, what would be your expectations putting together a show like that not monetarily as far as how much you're be willing to spend or anything, but more or less like what would a successful exhibition be for you? Would it be the work of you getting back in there, getting your hands dirty again, producing a show and that's, that's the win or yeah. is it, or do you, do you hope to get anything else out of it? I mean, sales are always nice, but you know, they're going to be small prints. Um, and yeah. you know, I, the art market now is just, I'm not selling anything, to be honest. Um, but yeah, it's just getting out there, getting the work shown and, you know, kicking me around to to produce some work. Yeah. Yeah. And that's how it's always been with me. It's just, I've always, I always like making something, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I think Todd Heider once said that anyone who's just shooting digital, you got to make a print. You know, it, all those people shooting JPEGs and another, uh, yeah, it's absolutely true. It's, got, I've got to make something. Mm. Otherwise it doesn't exist for me. So having an exhibition will ensure that I get around to do that. Yeah. So. I think those that shoot, shoot digitally and if they do print their work, um, they will look at their work differently. I can say from experience myself, mm -hmm. um, working in the dark room, I, I see when I, when I'm taking film photos, I know that the result is going to end up in the dark room. Eventually I'm not taking them for any other reason. Um, but if you shoot digitally, you kind of think like, well, I'm done now, you know, I I've taken the image mm -hmm. and now I have this file and now it's done. But if you go further than that and you get it printed and you don't quite like the way it, you know, it came out and now you have to make sure your color profile is correct and you print it at the right printer and all those other things. And then finally you get what you think that's to me, that's the real image. Um, something I've been trying to do 
somewhat unsuccessfully because of impatience is I would prefer to scan the print than to scan the negative. Um, because I think that my work is done when the print is finished. And when I scan the negative, I then Photoshop it. Um, right. I usually don't have to heavily Photoshop anything, but of course you're, you might straighten something. You might change the curves of the image to, to make it more contrasty or whatever I do to my images. Everybody does something different is I'm doing that in the dark room anyway. And so to me, the, the final result, the final expression of the work is the print. And then if I scan the print, then you're seeing what I think the final expression is. That's interesting. See, I've, I've never, yeah, the only time I ever scan prints is just to put them up on the website. You know, if I'm selling them um, or, you know, putting them in the web, web shop. Um, now, I always like to scan the, the legs. It it just feels just feels like I'm archiving something and making a fresh start. And I can apply all the technology of Photoshop on something that maybe I couldn't do in the darkroom. It, it, it's like a fresh start to me. Yeah. Plus, No, I understand the archival portion of it. Um, yeah, I think... Yeah. I think if you are attempting to archive your work digitally, it is important to scan the mm -hmm. the negative if you have um, something that can scan negatives well, of course. But um, and I do that myself as well. I do have a sure. digital archive of all my of all my negatives. Uh, but if they do turn out differently than what is done in the dark room, mm, yeah, yeah, you know, they certainly do. I yeah. agree, and you um, know. The dark room, it's it you can lock yourself away and it's just beautiful, you know. Time stands still in there. Yeah, it, it is interesting because right now my situation is and I I I might be moving, um which could be which could end up that I have a better, more favorable situation than I have right now. I have a great dark room because our basement is fairly open. I put a utility sink in there. I have um, three enlargers now. Um, I'm starting to work on mounting an enlarger uh, horizontally the way Ansel yeah. Adams wow. did. Sure. <laughs> I saw Ansel Adams working and I'm like, oh, I could do that. You know, <laughs> so because uh, I would like to make larger prints. And that's mm -hmm. one way of being able to do it is when you shoot horizontally, you can, you know, sky's the limit yeah. then. But um so I'm very happy with that setup part of it. But um, as far as it being blacked out, I would actually like a galley type setup more than I have now. And um, so, yeah, it's it's interesting when I'm down there, it has to be at night and I'm not a night person. The other day I woke up at 430 in the morning and got down there, which was much better for me. Oh, I, I'm, I'm a morning person. Yeah, I've been working. I've been waking up at four o'clock every morning this morning. It was just like, yeah. I, and you I go right to the dark room? No, no, no. I, I can't do that. <laughs> a little Not tea that much first. Of the and, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> so how often are you getting in the dark room now? I've been in the dark room every day for the past four weeks. So, oh. you know, and then it depends on the jobs that are coming in. Yeah. Then there might be a spate of case making, in which case I won't be in there for a week. But yeah, I, I'm, I'm in there all the time. It's there. So. I wish I had your M1 right now because I'm still on my Intel Mac. Oh, yeah. I bought the Intel Mac early 2020. It was the last 16-inch MacBook Pro Intel. It's full of everything that it can possibly have. It was nearly $5,000. And then, of course, they come out with the M series, which is, like, so much faster. And Oh, yeah. 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 Do you love your M1? I do. Yeah. I mean, before that, I had a really aging MacBook, uh, excuse me, Mac Pro, like the last one where you could put in so many hard drives. And I took out the optical drive. I put a hard drive in there. I think I had like six hard drives in that thing. And it was beautiful. But mm -hmm. it got to the point where I couldn't run. What was it? I, I can't remember what piece of software I couldn't run on it. So... 
yeah, I got the uh, I got the M1, but yeah, I'm happy with it. It's um, I do very little really strenuous stuff. I don't do any video or um, stuff like that. So for, for Lightroom, Photoshop, it just works fine. But, yeah. And you were talking earlier about YouTube. Um, I'm very much not a YouTube kind of person. If, if watching, I have to, you mean? Uh, yeah, watching or learning or doing anything with YouTube. Interesting. If I if I have to learn about something, give me a PDF. You know, any day. Um, I I know people that will just sit and watch YouTube videos on how to do something. I can't do that. That's so, interesting. Yeah, and they're older than me, so I don't know what it is. <laughs> well, everybody <laughs> learns differently. I mean, I thought yeah. so. So, how did you learn darkroom printing? Uh, trial and error, really. I got a job. My very first job was in a lab. We had a small studio, did a lot of commercial work, nothing really interesting, but that gave me the, and I'd been printing at home. We had a small dark room at home, um, like a laundry room, you know, that we could turn over. And, um, but then I, I you know, I, I had this crazy idea that at one point that I wanted to be an advertising photographer and that lasted for about six months and it's like, huh. no way, you know, but I originally, I, I wanted to be a cinematographer. So um, that's still fascinates me. And, I uh, could see in your work that you'd be very good at that. Thanks. Yeah, it, 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 it's something that just fascinates me. The technical aspect of it and the lighting and setting things up. Um, but yeah, you know, things changed and I ended up in the dark room, but um yeah, I do you still follow cinematography at all. I do. Yeah, I subscribe to the magazine, and um, yeah, you know, it's uh, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Did you see that um, the cinematographer for Dune, which I think his first name is David, but do you know who that is? I don't know. I'm not. He's a good film on photographer. Text. Oh, okay. okay. So, did you? If you if you haven't seen, they made a large photo book mm. where the cinematographer i can't remember his name right now and I, i'm trying not to look at my yeah, computer yeah, yeah. at all while we're having this conversation yeah. um i believe his first name is david but i could be hmm. wrong um but he shoots on film in fact he shot a lot of dune on film and uh he created this large photo book i think it's like four hundred dollars or something it's not a cheap oh, wow. book and Josh Brolin, who's an actor in the movie, wrote some poetry that is Ooh. in the book as well. I could justify the cut because I think they made two of them. And I'm like, that's a lot of money for a couple of books. But um, and I think it just hit the bestseller list this hmm. week. So maybe one day I'll find uh, someone that is, you know, coughing it up and I'll grab one of those. But yeah, uh, yeah. but that always interests me because obviously the the highest technology i'm sure the studios are pushing more towards digital for the ease of it and everything and only only certain directors or cinematographers that have enough clout can probably force their will upon the you know these production houses that say hey listen i know that film because they to in order to edit the movie as far as i am aware and i don't follow this too closely but they'll shoot on film they'll they'll digitize it right so that they can edit yeah and then they put it back on film yeah so that it, they can it, put it in the theater yep yeah, you know it, it but it's that, that kind of merging of technology you know the the digital combined with the analog you know that the way that you make digital legs for platinum printing or you know director plate for photographer now i just love that that merging of all these technologies and yeah, I can remember not too long ago, everyone was, you've got to shoot analog, you've got to be pure, you know, it, no digital aspect to it at all. And it's like, I've never, you know, it's, it's just, it's just a chain, you know, it's just another link in the chain, the whole digital thing. You end up with a print, you know, a handmade print. How you get to that, I don't care. So, yeah. Will you yeah. ever retire? No, I don't think so. Um, 
you know, I don't know. I'm having too much fun, to be honest. I know it's you know, cliche, but I'm in a profession where I'm self-employed. I'm working for people that I enjoy working for. And so retirement for me may be slow down a little, do more of my work, travel a little more, work on a project. Who knows? Um, but no, I can't see myself ever retiring. So it's just, yeah. We went back to London for my daughter's wedding last August and all the family members, when are you going to retire? You know, it's, it's not going to happen. So, I, you know, I don't know what I'd do. So I'd end up in the darkroom. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think the mentality of it, though, would be interesting to me because mm -hmm. what I've seen from my friends who have retired that are older than me and my parents or whatever is that your perspective instantly changes. Mm -hmm. um, that, and it could be, there, I mean, there are people that get bored. I, I'm not someone that gets bored. Right. Um so if I retired, I'd be doing the exact same thing you do. I'd be like exactly. more of what I'm already doing. Yeah, that's <laughs> um, exactly. But the perspective of it changes a little bit from chasing after something, a paycheck or whatever, mm -hmm. to maybe being able to allow yourself to focus on yourself more. That's exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Just doing what I want more of it. So, yeah. Uh, what is something that's still challenging in the dark room for you? Oh, well, I, I can tell you exactly what that is. It's calibration. I've, you know, calibrating polymer gravure, calibrating digital legs. It's, I'm not a math kind of person. And the software out there does make, make it a lot easier. Um, but I just hate having to do that because I'm a, I'm a printer that prints from the heart more than anything. I don't own a densitometer. I don't read all those, you know, little squares. I mean, you know, <laughs> <laughs> this is what this has been my life this week. But it's part of the process, and it's it needs to be done. And I was thinking about this earlier today. How much I thought it was easier when we were working just with analog film, but it wasn't really. I mean making film positives for graviers or digital negs for, excuse me, negs for platinum, you know, using sheet film. Um, yeah, it was just as hard. Things changed. Temperature of developers changed. You know, the, um, yeah, your mood, at least with a digital neg or a digital film positive or whatever it might be, you've got a constant, but I'm not a math kind of guy, so that just drives me crazy. So I, I put it off as long as I can and, you know, but it's back to the same old story that I mentioned earlier that, you know, products change all the time, plates change batch to batch, you know, you're always having to calibrate for something. So, yeah. And I found more and more people who have taken my class or know about polymer gravure, they don't want to make plates anymore. They want me to make them. And, ah. you know, so that's another thing I'm getting into making plates for people um, because I'm dealing with it all the time. Right. And for them, that will be just, you know, big money pit. So. Yeah. Um, so what is your process when you're saying digital negatives, what is your process right now that involves something that looks like a did like that's a digital negative platinum? you know, a, a platinum print. Um, so if it's if it's uh, my work, it's invariably shot on film. So I would scan the neg, do the work in Photoshop, output a digital neg. Um, for clients, usually I have very few shooting film now, obviously. And so they'll give me the file, usually a raw file. Um, they might supply a match print for me to to work towards, which is always good. Um, but otherwise it, it's, um, everything goes through Photoshop and an Epson printer. Excuse me, but it's not, a, a, thanks. It's not a digital, you're saying the words digital negative, but do you mean that it actually right. is a negative? 
Yeah, it, it's a negative. Yeah, yeah. I mean, people people use that phrase, so it yeah. is rather than. I'm just not. Now, I don't think I'm familiar with with okay. that. So if you're if you're if you're printing it, you would have to end up printing a positive. No, right. Um, no. So it would go from Photoshop to a sheet of film. Okay, you're printing onto a, a, onto a film. sheet. I yeah, excuse me, oh, okay. excuse me. Yeah. Okay. So, so then, pick... when then you do your platinum palladium process. Right. Correct. Um, yep. What size are you printing to? Eight by ten. Platinum. No, yeah. sixteen twenty, twenty twenty four. Oh wow! In the old in the old days, twenty twenty four. Now, uh, with the P eight hundred on thirty eight eighty, then you're limited to a maximum width of seventeen inches. So. 16 by 20 is a good size. Put that on a so large sheet. Just contact of... prints then almost. Yeah. Oh, after yeah. That. Yeah. Everything's a contact print. Yeah. Oh, With wow. a big UV light source. Yep. Yeah. So I have a, a um, LED UV light source now. Um, before we moved studios, we had a big five kilowatt mercury halide um, plate burner. But, mm. uh, you know, that's. <laughs> Hot, expensive. The, is that something where you'd actually would put it into like a shelf almost that it would expose it or no? Well, the light would hang down from uh, okay. the ceiling. And then we had a vacuum frame about a foot and a half, two feet under that. Um, but the lamps alone are $300, $400 to replace on this thing. It was just expensive. And yeah. so we got a, a, a nice LED lamp unit from John Cohn. So, LEDs are amazing. They are. They really are. Yeah. Yeah. How do those printed negatives hold up? Would you say? I'm assuming you have a pretty wide array of them stored somehow and and mm, how do they hold up? I tend uh, not very well. I mean, um like I said earlier, it's a, it's a link in the chain. If you need another neg you go back and you remake it. So I've never been too careful with the inkjet mm -hmm. negs, the digital negs, because you can always remake them. And so, uh, yeah, they're very, they can get scratched easily. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, not like, not like film, sheet film can as well, of course, but. Oh, sure. I, I was just curious like if you knew how they hold up compared to sheet film or something. No, I mean, um, you know, if you lay, if you lay something over them, then I don't know whether it's the outgassing or whatever it is, you get a mark that mm. will show up. So I, you know, I keep them for the, for the length of the, the job and this, you know, the required amount of time that an edition might be printed, but with platinum, very few people are printing an edition straight away it's too expensive you know? yeah. so we're doing them one by one and you know the next hold up over a period of time if you keep them in the dark i keep them in flat files but if it gets scratched or if there's you know something amiss you just make another who inspires you currently currently you mean a contemporary living photographer or just anyone um you know, in the old days, I would have said uh, Stieglitz, Strand, people like that. But lately, um, there are a lot of Scandinavian photographers and Japanese photographers that whose work I really, really love on Instagram. And, and um, Oivind Yelman, if you know him. Yelman. Um, yeah. I have to see um, his work, but doesn't it doesn't ring he, a bell? So he shoots, that sounds Swedish, though. Yeah, yeah. Is he the Swedish or Norwegian? He shoots with a Harmony camera, which is a metal version of like a Diana. Yeah, and his his work is just um, it's just incredible. I mean, it's but it has a it has a similar look to. Um, the Diana, but you know, I'm trying to find something that is inspiring here. I mean, I just love, I love his work. It's, uh, you know, nothing's really going to come across well. Yeah, of course. So, yeah, but you know, so, it's, um, sorry, go ahead. No, so, uh, is he's working now? 
Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah he's, he's um, very much so. And I love his work. Um, who else? Nancy Rexroth, of course, with the Diana. Um, Thomas Joshua Cooper. Um, being very dark, kind of in tone. Um, yeah. And, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to think of names right now. But yeah, it's always difficult it's, it's always when someone a, asks you. Uh, <laughs> always. I keep a note on my phone because even I'll forget, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, who my inspirations are. Uh, well, it, just... it's, it's like people would always say, you know, who are your clients? Who do you work for? And, you know, suddenly everything's gone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, are you harder to impress now than 20 years ago? I don't know. That's that's a hard question. That's a good question. Um, I think I'm more open with uh, a lot of the work. I mean, in the in the past, I think I think when I was in London, it was all about you know the gravure, the platinum, the silver prints. So the photographers I would be impressed by were those that were working within those techniques. Now I think I'm a little more open. Um, and there's uh, an artist, Jada, Jada Feo, I think it is a woman. She was, uh, she did some photography. She was, you know, she was a painter, um, but I love her work, you know, some of her photography. Um, so there are, you know, Todd Heido, I love his work. I mean, uh, I don't know whether I could, I mean, that's not my kind of, personally, that's not my kind of work, but yeah. I just love the way he goes out and approaches those subjects. So, yeah, I think I'm I'm a little more open to looking at um, different artists now than just the regular, you know, well-known names. Yeah, I I I saw that something similar with myself. I never used to be drawn to abstract painting, and I ran a website called the Watercolor Gallery for. 10 years mm -hmm. and um it's coming back for those that are still listening to this interview um and it is going to be a members only special about the process of bringing that back because when i was curating that website interviewing artists um my own tastes began to evolve slightly from mm -hmm. only being interested in the work in the type of work that others that others were creating that I wanted to emulate yep. to being beyond that, to being um, I, I respect everything for what it is on its own, even if it's not what I want mm -hmm. to do. Mm -hmm. And with abstract, I, perhaps I just didn't get it for a long time. Um, I couldn't understand it. I thought it was too easy, whatever. Yeah. Um, and then when you realize that it's the opposite of easy. Uh, and so a lot of, just like everything else in life, if something looks simple, it usually means that somebody's really good at it. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, I, I've seen the same thing in myself is the more I'm exposed to work uh, and on, you know, I devour a lot of stuff. Um, then I'm more, appreciative of the things that even if it's not my cup of tea i still mm -hmm. am like i know what goes into yep. that yeah and so i appreciate it yep. um so a lot of the people that you mentioned and a lot of the work that you're kind of showing is kind of dark and mm. moody stuff um do you have you ever thought about why you like that aesthetic so much I haven't thought about it. It's just how I see things, you know. It's um, you don't like a bright sunny day, <laughs> you know. I, I <laughs> it's it's like you just stay not... stay in your dark room on those days. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we were in the Badlands. It was like Fourth of July, and it was like a hundred degrees out, and everything's so bright. And someone said to me, "You you could make that like it's midnight and really dark." <laughs> exactly. And and. I, I don't know what it is. I mean, it's not that I I don't want to print really dark to the point where you don't see anything. I like to be able to 
look into the shadows, see a little bit of detail. And I think I'm getting lighter, to be honest, over, you know, over the past few years. But I do like to see detail there. And someone once made the comment, and I always like something a little like a, a, a focal point, a bright spot of something not glaring white, but something a little lighter. And one, someone once made the comment, they said that rather than, you know, kind of, it, it's like you're going towards the light, things are going to get better rather than you're kind of regressing and that little dot is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So, and I thought that was, I'd never thought of it that way, but I think that's probably true. Um, but I don't know why I, I, maybe it's coming from London, you know, where everything's gray <laughs> and miserable or, but it's, I do like the darker, softer tones. Yeah. 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 Although having said that, um, you know, I like the, I like Robert Adams's work and, you know, he's very light and I'm, I'm, I'm embracing that. I like that, but yeah. I've tried working that way and I go in the dark room and I start off light by the end of the day, everything's. <laughs> everything's really dark again yeah that's funny yeah don't know why yeah so i've been i've been in the dark room for about five years like i said not not quite um and because of covid i've had to learn on my own mm -hmm. um i've never been in the dark room with somebody else that knows what they're doing uh and i i wish that i had someone next to me helping me um and you said that the way that you learned was trial and error and that's certainly yeah. the way that i'm learning yeah. um i am thankful for youtube i think the best money i've ever spent is getting youtube premium because i don't listen to any of the ads and it's right. i think it was you know less than 200 dollars a year and i never have to see an ad again and youtube has be youtube has become an amazing resource for that for me because when you don't have to deal with all those ads all the time you find yourself reaching for that a little bit more than you used to even because yeah. you, you you know you're like oh i can just look this up really quick and, and you can uh -huh. get through and it you know it's it's interesting yeah. how having no ads actually changes your relationship to youtube quite a bit but um if, if only they do that for sorry if only they do that for instagram <laughs> well, you yeah. know, it's interesting because like Facebook has this thing where you can pay like 14 bucks a month for yeah. different things. I, I can't believe they don't have an ad free version yet, yeah. but maybe someday. Um, what would be your biggest tip for someone that's at my stage where um, I'm getting there? I think uh, I don't I'm not down there every night like, you, like you're down there every day. I mean, I, it, obviously, I have a day job and all that. So, sure. um, but. You know, four or five years in, I finally feel like my feet are under me. Uh, I feel like I could take some of my work and, and make an image. Um, yeah. What What do you think that at that time, you know, if you look back where you were five years in or something, what are some of the leaps that you were able to make and some of the things that yeah. you... You see, learned? I'm I'm just, I'm one of those people that learns by mistake and I I... I've never really, I mean, there was one person, one printer that I spent time, that's not true. There were three people, three printers in London that had an influence on the way I work. Um, one I worked for, for a short period of time, very small lab, just three of us. And a couple of other printers who were printing exhibitions and nice work. And one of those, I'd go down there and I would just learn by watching but i've never really I, I just like going in the dark room and doing it myself learning from my mistakes um yeah that's the only way to do it as far as i'm because i'm the wrong person to ask you know it's uh yeah i, I just i don't i'm self-employed i mean i, I was going to say i don't like being told what to do and that's not that's not true but i like finding my own way you know so yeah, the way just, i looked at it was uh you know it's 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 expensive to do some of this stuff um mm -hmm. and the larger you want to print and stuff of course it gets more expensive um but i just looked at it as I, i'm paying for my education so yeah. 
yeah. rather than going to a school or something, um, the material costs and the time are the cost of my education. Yeah. But it's always been expensive. I mean, yeah. maybe less so I you know, I in the 80s and 90s, but it's it's always been an expensive you know, yeah. craft. Um, and, you know, I look at I look at boxes of inkjet paper now. I mean, it's just astronomical how much that the box oh, yeah. costs. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the, you well, know, it's high technology, in my opinion, even film today, sure. you know, film, of course, was high technology when it was first invented but i still think it's high technology i um mm. again i'm going to be referring to youtube i'm sorry but there was a uh uh there's a very popular channel called smarter every day who did a tour of kodak mm. and showed the the he did it i think it was yeah. three 30 minute videos or something like pr pretty in-depth tour of kodak and how they make the emulsion and how they make the yeah. chemicals and everything and there's no question that they deserve fourteen dollars a roll or whatever the current cost mm. is. Yeah, yeah. I think the thing I miss now is just the variety of films that were available, the papers that were available. I mean, if you wanted a particular look, there would always be a paper that you could go to for a particular surface or, you know, warmth. And I, I produced a, um, a body of work, a project, Other World, and it was on this beautiful paper um foma and it had this look to it. it had a surface that wasn't wasn't a stipple it wasn't glossy it wasn't a pure matte and fortunately i i bought enough paper to finish the project and then suddenly it's discontinued and so i have a couple of boxes in the freezer right now but just make your own <laughs> you see okay <laughs> And again, and I, I'm, just... I'm only half joking because I, no, I, I have seen a documentary about a married couple that couldn't find the paper they were using anymore, and they and they ended up making it themselves. Yeah, that was um, was that the Lodema paper, the yes. printing out paper? Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, the names are gone. Yeah. Right now, but yeah, I mean, there was someone some years ago on the forums and uh he said that if film would become unavailable he'd make his own but it's some of it's not possible no he yeah. was an engineer and he did work for kodak but, oh well then you know. <laughs> <laughs> he, he has a leg up i guess but he did yeah he did, even so he i mean so. if you look at the machines that they have yeah. in those buildings in new york i mean yeah you the, some of those machines will never be made again obviously so mm -hmm. yeah you know it, it's it's no different from polymer reviewer you know it's um mm -hmm. i mean the plates come and go plates that yeah. i loved two years ago you can't get anymore and a lot of it is pandemic related um but it, it, you know all these yeah, these these materials just come and go, and you know, an alternative would have taken its place many years ago. But um, it, yeah, it's, everything's a moving target right now. So yeah, Ilford, well, are, Ilford are there, and you know, I stick with Ilford as best I'm, I can. I'm very happy that that they made it through. Yeah, the, yeah, some of these time periods, and I'm also happy that it seems like things are on an upswing. Um, mm -hmm which makes it for business, it makes it very difficult to forecast, right? So when there's massive popularity or hype around something, we see it with Fujifilm, some of their, mm -hmm. some of their cameras exploded on TikTok or something and they can't keep up with demand. And then of course they invest. And then, you know, what if that demand goes away? So it's very difficult for businesses to forecast. It would sure. be nice if it was just steady all the time. Sure. Um, but it does seem like film, darkroom printing and and other things we're seeing new cameras being made we're seeing new emulsions or at least bringing back old emulsions and stuff mm. so there does seem to be a good trend and and i'm hoping that it all equals out to be meaning that this is just going to last a, a bit longer mm -hmm. yeah i think it will be around i don't think there's any you know yeah. i don't think there's any you know risk of it just disappearing but you know those. i think there is but, but those I, old fav really yeah, because, you know, my one request of you at the end of this is to please share more of your 
expertise, your work, share some, share more on Mastodon, share more on your blog, um, because, you know, when this is going to sound like an interesting or maybe an odd analogy, but when the Apollo program ended and all of those brilliant people that had all that experience left NASA, retired, passed away, it has taken many years and many billions of dollars for some of these um, private companies to get back to where we were in 68, uh, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. and institutional knowledge is enormous and, and cultural knowledge is enormous. And I think, you know, there is so much knowledge held up there is, there is a lot of books of course and books will hopefully be around forever and hopefully they're digitized and stuff by now but people are are full of knowledge and every time i see a youtube video with someone that has a lot of experience like yourself watching them do what they do i learn far more than reading mm -hmm. a book yeah it, it's something that's been playing on my mind because you know i do have a lot of i mean the guy that i i worked for in london you know small lab there were only three of us he grew up in Fleet Street, which was the newspaper, um, the, the uh, national newspaper um, offices there. And, you know, he left school. He's a guy who left school 15, 14, 15 years old and went to work in the dark rooms. And much of what I've learned has come from him. And, you know, I was working with Pyro Developer, mm. like the old Edward Weston formula. And he would he would tell me, you know, you've got to use this film, you've got to expose it like this, you've got to process it like that. And that was invaluable. So, that, yeah, there, yeah, I do feel this responsibility to pass this knowledge on. Well, just um, record yourself doing what you do. I think, yeah. you know, if, if, uh, if, because you're still doing it, which is nice, you don't even have to make up a reason, but right. if you're working and you could record a little bit of it, it doesn't have to have high production quality. I think there's a lot of information in just you doing what you do. Yeah. I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm that quiet retiring guy, you know, that's why I love the I dark. I, I understand. You know, I just, but yeah. I, but if I, I lived, what if I live near you, I would be with you every day. If so. And you would be more than welcome. <laughs> but <laughs> I no, I, 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 I understand what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, thank you so much for having a chat. Maybe we'll do it again sometime. Absolutely. Anytime, Colin. Thank you yeah. so much. It's been fun. I appreciate that. Um, speaking of scanning, I have to do quite a bit of scanning. I just. Uh, that That's probably the hardest part for me is is. That a, pro a project is is there's a lot of work from beginning to end and. Sure each piece I have to like find time to do, you know, it's like, okay, well, I found time to go shooting. Now I got to find mm -hmm. time to develop the film. Now I got to find time to scan the film. Now I got to find time yeah. to archive it. I got, you know, it is, yeah. it's, uh, sometimes I, I, there are times where I want to throw the towel in, but the, the, those are the times that I feel like if I push through to the other side of it, there's something waiting for me there. Mm -hmm. Almost every time that I've learned anything in life, because I'm all self-taught, I'm a programmer by trade and I'm all self-taught with that. And every time that I've wanted to give up is right before something pretty good came as a result of it almost every time. And so I feel like the same way in the dark room. And I I've seen the same thing there too. Uh, I'll have a really bad night in the dark room. Nothing's working the way that I think it should. And then I go back the very next time and I make the best print I have so far yep. or whatever. Yep. So, yep. No, I, I understand that completely. I get it. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's, uh, it's interesting. And then imposter syndrome, of course, I deal with, which is maybe something that we could talk about next time. I Yes, that that's me. That's me for sure. Is it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess I everybody has it. And I think that's probably why, you know, I, I don't get into putting more information out there because it's like, who am I? You know, it's like, I'm not. Yeah. I think I suffer from that a lot. That is interesting. I've been asked many times to give advice to bloggers. I've been at conferences and gave speeches to bloggers and all kinds of things. And one of the main things that always comes up at any of those events or in discussions 
is people feel like, well, what do I have to mm. contribute? Whether they're writing about programming or writing about technology or writing about knitting or food making or whatever. And all I can say is the fact that it's you. That is the difference mm. is that it's your story. It's your perspective. Yep. It's yours. And even if it's the same as somebody else's, which it inevitably really isn't. Um, yeah, I, I have to say that if you can get over that hurdle um, of thinking that you have to be contributing something unique um, or different or better or whatever, um, there it is very rewarding to get information out. Yeah. I, you know, I, I'm starting to teach workshops, not in the, you know, partner. so many people have asked me if I'd give a workshop on platinum printing, but certainly case making and things like that. And I enjoy it. it it's really nice, nice to be able to, you know, sit down, give a workshop one-on-one -on -one at the studio here or for a small group, six people, whatever it might be. Um, yeah, I do enjoy that, you know, once I've overcome that fear of, you know, teaching a workshop to yeah. six to 12 people, then yeah, everything goes fine. But, you know, the classes at the, the College of Art and Design are just fantastic, like I say, mm -hmm. because you're throwing these people into, you know, something they've had no experience with usually. And, um, you know, they're just so excited. So that makes you feel good. Yeah. That's for sure. With me, once I get started, people have to shut me up. So it's I have the opposite problem because <laughs> I, I I'm so I'm so fascinated. I'm so excited by mm -hmm. this sort of thing that I, I always tell people. Like they'll ask me, like, "Oh, what got you into photography?" I'm like, "Don't ask me unless you really want to know," because <laughs> yeah. we're going to be here a while. <laughs> you know, my 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 problem is, um, I I I just assume everyone's doing exactly the same as me you know i'm tucked away mm. in a small studio in a dark room in northeast minneapolis and i just assume everyone's working the same way and i had to give a talk to two classes at a college here um, a couple of years ago one was an inter intermediate to a slightly advanced class and one was a beginner class and no one told me which was which and wow. so i went in and i assumed that the first class was the intermediate and i just laid them out you know with all this technology and digital negs and and a lot of glazed eyes and suddenly someone said no this this is the beginner class <laughs> <laughs> okay but i have that problem of just uh kind of going too far with technology um explaining it assuming everyone is making digital negs or you know that that's yeah. my problem so yeah well thank you so much for taking the time you're welcome. Thank you, Colin. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. So, and if you ever find yourself in.